We are continuing in our study of Thessalonians. Uh, we've got some Bibles back there. We've got some Bibles over there. If you want to grab those blue Bibles and turn with me, we are in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, we're going to wrap up chapter 2 this morning. Uh, and as you're turning your Bibles, I'd ask that you guys would pray with me uh, one more time. Lord, I, it is a joy to open your word together as a family of God as those who are seeking you, Jesus, seeking to know you greater in a deeper way, that these words would uh, not, they, they won't leave us empty, Father, but these words would penetrate our hearts, that we would write them on our hearts to know them well, that we would be challenged by them and encouraged by them as we continue to grow and to live out and reflect you, Jesus, in all of who you are. So I just ask for these things, that I would get out of the way of what you have to say, Father, that you would speak clearly to our hearts, that your spirit would move within us, that you would continue to challenge and grow us as we want to. It is our deep desire to know you well. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. There's an old, well, he's not that old. He just passed away probably 20, 30 years ago. His name is Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, he's an Anglican preacher over in England. And he was real famous from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And a uh, well-known preacher, he was a medical doctor for years, felt the call, and he became a doctor of the church. So they call him the doctor. And uh, he's well-known for his series on Romans. And so if you ever think, man, Jason, he spent a really long time in Thessalonians, uh, I want you to know that Martin Lloyd Jones spent 12 years in Romans, and he never finished. So Jason's doing okay, right? No. And when he was on his, his deathbed, this is one of the stories I, I love so much about him. And this is his life. This is who Martin Lloyd-Jones was. On his deathbed, he called his family in, and they were gathered around. And he looks at them, and he says, stop praying for me. Stop praying for me. Let me depart to the final glory. That was his words. Don't, don't pray. I, don't, I, I want to go home to be with Jesus. I want to go home to the final glory the immense assurance that had, that he knew exactly where he was going, he knew exactly what was going on, he knew his life was going to end, and he knew he was going to be with Jesus. And that was his heart's desire. Just stop. I want to go. Let me be with the God who I love. Let me be with the God who I know. I can't wait to be in that final glory. And first off, the immense assurance he had was overwhelming to me. But the second thing that really struck me was his use of the word Glory. It's a word that we typically have a hard time, at least I do, using in Christianity. It's kind of a weird word um, because uh, we're all from Minnesota, at least I think we are, um, except well, Dean's here. He's from South Dakota, right? But we'll forgive you um, in our jealousy. We're all passive-aggressive Minnesotans to some degree where we, we don't like to talk about ourselves and we think that anything that's complimented to us, we've got to throw it off right away. Oh, that was a wonderful casserole. Oh, that was, that was just my mom's recipe. We've all done it. We've all done it in some degree or sense. So when we talk about this word glory, we get nervous. I don't know what to do with that. Oh, it's God's glory. I don't, I don't. But there's something about glory that he had and that he was going to. That's what, that's what he understood. He, and, and so that's really what we're going to dive into a little bit today because where Paul has been where he has been challenging the church in Thessalonica. He's been talking about the end times, the last things. He's, uh, you know, I know you just covered a section where they talked about the man of lawlessness and to be aware for that and, and signs that are coming that this is going to be the end of the age. And he's going to wrap up. And we can't miss this because sometimes we read these chapters and it's like, oh, 2 Thessalonians 2, that's about the man of lawlessness and the end times. And then we go on to chapter 3. But these ending verses are so important. And they're important because they give us the what do we do with this-ness of the passage. We can't miss these ending passages where Paul takes what we've learned and it's not just so that I may know, just so I have more knowledge, just so I have this idea of how I know what to, and I can impress my friends with trivia. That's not what, we have to have a purpose in what we're learning. We have to have a purpose in what Paul is doing. And that's where he goes and uh, we're going to, Start in 2, verse 13, and we're going to go through 17. Paul is giving us the practical instructions of 
This is what you have learned, but now here's what we have to do. And a part of that is understanding glory. Glory as something we see that is God's alone. We sing glory to God. 100% right. We can't wait for the glory of heaven where we get to be with God face to face and to be in His presence without sin. Great. But there's also a glory of now. And we wrestle with that because we don't want to have glory now because it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like it's fitting. I can't have glory because I'm, I'm still sinful. I can't have glory because I still do things wrong. I, I can't have glory because that's only for God. But the Bible again and again and again talks about the inherent glory that comes in Christians' lives while on earth. And that has a purpose. It's drastically, vastly different than the glory we give to God. But it is nonetheless still there. So what do we do with that? What do we, how do we have this? And it really comes down to a question that we all asked ourselves at one point. But we need to ask ourselves a question that goes even deeper. We've always, I mean... Have you ever had these conversations with people where they say, oh, what is, the, what is the purpose of this life? Or what's the point of this life? Or what are we doing here? And then you have these rambling musings, depending on who, they, who you're talking to and what they believe, these random musings of, oh, I think life is this, and I think life is that. Well, we as Christians, if I were to say, what's the purpose of this life? We would probably say to glorify God in all that we do. And that would be a really good answer. That's a really good answer. Um, But the question I want to ask us that goes maybe a level further down is why is that our purpose? Why is it our purpose that we live to glorify God? Why? Because we really, what Paul is getting at, and he's painting a picture that's much broader than what sometimes at least I have thought of Christianity in the past. I've so often think Christianity as I am in this world, I am a sinner, and I'm trying to survive doing as little sin as possible, so when I get to the end of it, and Jesus says, well done. And that's, and that's that. And I was like, that's, but that's not, that's not enough. That's not big enough. That's not as big as what the Bible talks about. Because there's something that we look way from the beginning to way to the end. If we span this idea and we put this verse in the context of all of the Bible and all of creation and all of eternity to come, our purpose, the why of who we are is so much greater and so much deeper than just trying to survive as Christians. Because when we were created, he created us very specifically, right? He created us uniquely. He created us in his image. There is no creature in heaven or on earth that was created in his image except humanity. And we still bear that image. Although it has been distorted, we have sinned, we have messed up, absolutely. But we still bear that image. And in that image, we reflect a dignity that is the image of God. The image of God has not been completely destroyed. It has not been completely taken away. It has not been completely destroyed. In fact, as we become Christians, we get to recognize more of that relationship with God. In some sense, we are walking little mirrors. We walk around and people should look at us and they should... uh, do you guys have this when you drive around? Like I have my phone, I sit on the council next to me in my truck and I'm driving and if I turn just right, the sunlight comes in and it hits my phone and goes right in my eyes. Like no matter where I put it on my account, it's, it's annoying I cannot, and I have to turn it over or move it under the seat. Every single time. You think I would learn by now. That's what I want us to be as Christians. That when, when we're walking around and people see us, that light that reflects us and it reflects into them is the light that we see. That's the glory that I'm talking about. It's not a glory that I have made. It's not a glory that I possess. It's not a glory that I have done by my actions or my good works or my good things or me looking like I'm a good churchy Christian. It's the glory that I reflect because I reflect the glory of God. Because I was made in the image of God. And that's in that image, in that dignity, In that God's purposeful creation of me in his image, I reflect his glory. And what does that mean for us? That gives us the why. That gives us the why of of, of glorifying God forever. It's the why is because I was created to reflect his glory. And I was created to show and to bring and to display that glory in all of creation. That's, That's what he's getting at. Because as we talk about the end times, we can, we can get panicky, can't we? 
We can get anxious. We can get nervous. We can get um, sometimes depressed or just um, uncomfortable. I think of all the conversations I had with people during COVID over the years. Well, this, what if this is the end times? What if this is the last days? And I'm just like, then I should be really happy because that means I'm going to be home soon. That means I have a hope. But we can get nervous about these conversations. But every conversation we have about the end days, about the end times, no matter what the topic is, as Christians, it should do two things in us. One, it should give us this immense happiness and immense hope and immense joy of knowing that Jesus is coming and I get to be with my Jesus. Okay? No matter what the, what, what the conversation is, we're not going to fall down into details, but we're going to end up with saying, I'm just happy that I get to be with Jesus soon. And the second thing it should do for us is that it should inspire a sense of urgency in us. Because that there are people who we interact with every day who are not going to know Jesus. They don't know Jesus. They don't have hope. They're in a dying world without any glimmer of hope. They have no notion of why they exist or for what purpose they exist. We have this immense gift as Christians to know what and why we are here and to give a glory of going out. Because at the core of this glory, this humanly earthly glory, that is so small in comparison to godly glory, at the, at the core of this reflection that we have of God's glory is in its very essence a purpose. I would call it a mission. That we are to go and to share the glory. That we are to go out to the nations and to talk about this glory. That we are to go out and say, I once was lost, but now I have been found. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. That we are to, part of this is that that's what we are doing. That's what this glory is. It's not this, I am so great, but it's, look what God has done in me, and I'm a walking example of how he has changed me. That's what Paul is getting at here. He is the creator, and I am blessedly happy to be the creature that he has created. But he has not left us without a relationship. That's incredible. That's incredible. So, why don't you uh, join with me? We're going to jump into verse 13. It says, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So, if you are a Bible note taker, like I am, uh, this should sound really familiar because just a few, just a chapter ago in chapter 1, if you even look back a page, first, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, Paul starts off, we ought to always give thanks to you because you're the brothers, because we're giving thanks. This is almost word for word the same thing as what was said before. Paul is reminding us on purpose, I am thankful for you that we are in this. I ought to always give thanks in every situation as we look in 1 Thessalonians to pray without ceasing, to always give thanks to God for you. And he uses this word that's really unique. He says, beloved. Beloved. That's not a word you find common in Scripture. And you start to see as you look back at these, some of the pronouns and some of the other words he uses in this passage, but we ought to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved. There's this our language, this us language, this beloved language. This is, as uh, I'm sure Jason has shared before, Paul is a very personally invested in this church. He loves these people. To call them beloved, that's a title. That's not say, hey man, I love you. It's you are my beloved. Now if I said that to Cody, that would be weird. But it shouldn't be weird. This is Paul going out saying, you're beloved. This is, you're the church, and I have beloved because God has given this, and we're all in this together. We share in this mission. We share in this purpose. We're growing. We're expanding. We have an aim. We have an end goal, because so often as Christians, we're just like, just, if I can just survive, and I'm just going to try to not sin as much as possible, and I get to heaven, it's going to be okay. And I feel like that's the mantra I continue to say. Just don't sin and survive and get to heaven. Just don't sin and survive and get to heaven. We say that over again and again and again. But I think so often we're going to get to heaven and I think we're going to be surprised at how, one, how wonderful it is, but also how similar it is to this world. God is going to renew and remake this world. And the joys that we experience are going to be 
multiplied a hundredfold, and the sin and pain and suffering in this world will be gone. But in this moment, I get to think about God. I get to contemplate God. I get to be on mission for God. I get to experience the joy of His glory as I continue to do the things of, for God's kingdom. I get to reflect God. That's one of the greatest joys I have seen in ministry is to just be obedient and to walk into a situation and to have something happen and to leave and just be like, I did absolutely nothing except exist in that moment. And God reflected and worked and moved in that person and I got to watch it happen. That's incredibly joyful to watch someone understand, to watch someone's life be transformed and know it's not you that did a thing. But God's worked in you, and God worked in them. That's, that's the joy. That's the glory that he's talking about. That's the glory that Martin Lloyd-Jones was getting at. Yeah, I can't wait for glory in the end times, and that will be an amazing thing. The word we want to continue, the phrase we want to continue to think about is the now, but the not yet. There is a yet to come that is going to be magnificent. But there is a now that is still real. Because we are in the image of God. We are on mission for God. We have a purpose. We have a why. We are created on purpose. We are created with precision and the dignity of God in us. Sometimes we forget that. We're so often, we like the uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin, that he might become sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. There's this idea of Christ in us, and, in, and we are in Christ. But we, we like to ignore those prepositions. And we like to think of Christianity as I'm doing, uh, doing my life next to Christ. Or I'm doing my life by Christ. Or I'm doing my life with Christ. No, no, no. The Bible is much more intentional. You are in Christ. And Christ is in you. And how can something that has been invested in our very souls, that has transformed our very hearts at the very core, leave us unaffected and untransformed, and this is why I think this is so much more, that there is a glory inherent in us, and it's not my own. It's the glory that I show out because it's God's glory. And it's just a, just a taste of what is to come. It's just a taste of what is coming. By the Lord, because God shows you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification, by the Spirit, and belief in the truth. First fruits. Paul is emphasizing um, that this is, you, you were the first people. You were not plan B. God didn't have his A team lined up and be like, well, that person didn't work out, so who else can I pick? We know from looking at many verses, Ephesians 1 that I'm thinking of, before the foundations of the earth were made, he chose you. That's, that's a great affirmation. We tend to think of election as a scary doctrine because it's like God chose this person to not be here when election all along is God chose you before the world was even created that you would be here right now with this purpose in mind. And we choose to live with that ignorant of that, that idea because God has got on this mission for us to share in the magnificent glory that is his kingdom expanding in this world. And when we get to heaven, we're going to see it even greater. Even more so. The first fruits. You were not an accident. You were not a secondary plan. You were not something that just happened to be. God is in control of everything. I truly believe that. You were the first fruits to be saved through sanctification, by the Spirit, and the belief in truth. So here's that churchy word. We've got to talk about what sanctification means. Sanctification means to sanctify. Right? Okay, Webster, right? You can't use the word in the definition, right? Sanctify means to make more holy, to make more like Christ, to make, to refine, to hone, to shine. We are continually growing in our Christ-likeness. Um, as Christians, we believe when you say yes to Jesus, you are saved. Done. Done fact. Yes, you and Jesus, you're saved. You'll go to heaven. But yet, we, no one runs a race. Here's the gun go off. We start running and we sit down across the, the start line. I'm good. No one does that. We are all called as we grow, as we go, to be continually growing in our faith. I'm, I'm not perfect, and I will never be made perfect in this life, 
But as I continue to go on this journey, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to better understand his mission and purpose. I want to better see how I can reflect the glory that God has smallly given me in his son Jesus to other people that they might begin this journey. That They are not left alone in the dark. That I might continue to recognize better in them. Hey, you have been made in the image of God. You have this dignity. You have something in you that no one else in the heavens and the world, no animal has. Let me, let me show you what this, this beauty is. And to continue to go out in that mission, because that's been the mission since creation. That didn't come about from the fall. This mission is still there. We are still called to glorify God in everything that we do. The fall, the sin, never changes that. That's still our mission. And it's the mission forever and ever. That doesn't change when we get to eternity. The glory that I have is still the glory that I want to give to the Father. I just get to do it even more so when I get there. The, the mission never shifts. The mission is always the same. That's why we continue to be sanctified, because I want to be better at it. Because when I get to heaven, it's not this, as drastic as it could have been. <laughs> but it's more so of, man, this is, it's not just sitting on clouds and playing harps, but it's, I get to contemplate God and his glory and who he is. Because that's essentially what glory is, is Everything that God is, that's glory in its existence. Everything that he is. 14, to this he called you through our gospel that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's my analogy. Here's what I'm thinking of. Because I wrestle with this idea of of having a little taste of glory now on us because it's like that's going to go to my head really fast, right? Um, It was my son Reed's second birthday on Friday, turn two, okay? So you got to imagine he wakes up and he comes in the living room and my wife and I are having this conversation with him saying, hey, Reed, it's your birthday. And he looks at me like, okay, <laughs> okay. And we're just trying to explain, like, I know what a birthday is, but other have, we've seen birthday parties, like, you know, but it's your birthday. You're two. How old are you? And he goes, one. No, no, two. We have to explain this to him. And we're trying to, then we start doing our birthday traditions where all of a sudden we get out and we go get donuts in the morning, bring back. And he's starting to realize that he got to go with, he got to pick the donuts out. And then the, my, the sisters give him the present right away in the morning. He gets to open up and no one else has a present. And all of a sudden he starts to, this realization starts to come into him. All of a sudden it's like, whose birthday is he? He goes, Reed's birthday. And he's so excited. And it's like, is it, is it my birthday? No, it's Reed's birthday. And he's just loving every minute of this. But he's not selfish. He's not a jerk about this. He's too. He's absolutely innocent. He's absolutely, this is just the joy of saying, I am, I am, it's my birthday and I'm enjoying every second of this. He's not being prideful about it. And that's, that's, that's what Paul means when it says, we reflect glory. It's not a pride. It's not a, look what I've done. It's this, look, God's in me. Look at, look at Jesus. Look at, look at how he's changed me. Because again, no one, people can argue with facts and, and they'll argue with you till they're, they're blue in the face, but no one can ever tell you that your story is wrong. No one can ever say, no, Jesus didn't change your heart. No, Jesus didn't change your life. That's, that's just like, look, look at this. Look at the joy that I have. Look at what I reflect. It's just like, I can't wait for my mirror to get shinier because I want to blind you. That's a, that's a joy that comes out of the, the depth of our hearts, not out of the selfishness of my actions. He's called you that you may obtain the glory of Jesus. It's there. It's there. C.S. Lewis wrote an essay called The Weight of Glory. It's well worth a read. It's one of my favorite things he's ever written. And he talks about glory in a twofold aspect. He talks about it as renown. Again, not our renown, but renown of Christ in me. And the way he also takes it as luminosity, which is first off a super fun word to say. Luminosity. But the idea that we light and we put off and we reflect what is in us. Luminosity. We so often as Christians want to define who we are by something that we lack. Well, I don't, I don't have God's goodness, so therefore I'm trying to be humanly good. Well, I'm, I have sin, but I've had Jesus, so I'm trying to have less of sin. And we try to define ourselves so often that way. We're trying to say, yes, I'm just, I'm just trying to survive. But the Bible gives us a little bit more. You have Christ in you. We can't put Christ down. We have Christ in us, in his, and he's the hope of glory, and they have that in us to, to live out now. 
We need to define ourselves by our, our relationship with Jesus. We need to define it. That needs to be our identity. The core of who we are cannot be something that I am lacking or that I am not. It's one thing to have no sin, to have our sins forgiven, but it is just as much the atonement and just as much the salvation in Jesus that he gave us his righteousness and he lives in us. We cannot forget the other piece of that. That needs to be who we are. That needs to define every aspect of us so that way when the world falls away and things get tough or things get great, we continue to fall back on the thing that drives and identifies our very hearts is that I am in Christ and he is in me and nobody in all of eternity forever and ever can take that from you. And it will never ever change. It is good to have self-denial. We, we want to be humble Christians. We want to be humble people. But so often we have made self-denial the end goal of our Christian life. We can't let that be the only reason we're here is to deny, no, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. That's okay. But that can't be the only thing we're about. We must be about the glory of Jesus. And for that to really take place, we have to wrestle with this idea that the glory of God is a little bit in us as the image bearers of God. But that glory is not for us to go to our heads, it is to drive us out into the world to say, and you need to see this glory too. You guys get what I'm getting at? I'm saying like a hundred times, okay, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about this. He says, um, we're so often content in the world when we should be doing far more things. He equates it to saying, we are making mud pies in the dirt. And he says, we are far too easily pleased. Far too easily pleased with the things of this world when God has so much more in stake for us. This is not toxin, talking in sense of money and wealth and power. That's not what I'm getting at. It's far much more in the sense of the glory that we get to be a part of in his kingdom. It's not even my timer. There is a joy in the mission of God. So then, brothers, verse 15, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Stand firm. Stand firm in what you know. Uh, so we, right away we go to this word traditions, and, and this is a, kind, of, kind of a scary word because, well, we, we think about traditions. We think about traditions in the church. We've heard wars over, not literal wars, but wars over things like we have to say this or we have to do it this way. We have to sing two songs and the pastor has to get up and do this many and then we have to get down and do this. And we get uncomfortable when it doesn't go that way. We think of that as a tradition. This is not the tradition that Paul is talking about. He's not talking about traditions of liturgy or traditions of church history. He's talking about the tradition of the gospel. He says, this is what I have taught you. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus does. This is what Jesus is doing. And this is what Jesus is going to do. You must operate by these traditions that you were taught by us as Paul, the other apostles, or the spoken word, which would have been the Bible at that time, or by our letter, which is also the Bible at the time. So Paul is saying, if it didn't come from me, and Paul got his gospel from his conversion on the road to Damascus, Jesus told him the gospel. I think we can trust Paul. <laughs> and we can trust the Bible. If it's not from that, we don't want to do with it. Tradition is truth. This is the truth we're talking about. And it's a reminder to us to not let other forms of tradition, other preferences, other things in our life start to influence the way that we think that the truth needs to go out. Everything else needs to fade in comparison to the greater glory of preaching Jesus. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't should fade, it must fade. Because there is no glory, there is nothing greater in this world that we can do except preach this. There isn't anything else. This is what we must do. And that's why he says, stand firm. Stand firm here. The world as we know it, we watch the news for five minutes, we get frustrated, we get upset, we, we wrestle through things. The world is not going well. The world is not doing smart things. Okay? But there is still truth, there's still hope in this world. And you have it. The world is dying. And it's going to hell. And we have the truth and the hope and the glory that can change everything. See, so, you now that's my timer. Everything. And we choose sometimes to do nothing with it. To just survive, to keep our head down. 
Stand firm does not mean be stubborn. Stand firm means to know, do what you know and to know what you do and then to do what you say because we do it because we are obedient. And that's a joy. That's a joy to be obedient. I promise you, when you step out in faith and you see God do something that you're like, I didn't do that, you will be filled with an immeasurable joy. Now that our Lord Jesus, this is 16, now that may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. This is 17. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work in word. Every good work in word. Jesus himself. I think this is really neat. Jesus himself does this. If we go back and you think of passages like Colossians 1, where it says Jesus was the creator of the earth, and he is the sustainer of the earth, and then he is the one who came and put on flesh and saved us. And here we have Jesus himself is the one with God the Father, which they are the same, who loved us, going back to that love again, we are the beloved of Paul and the beloved of God, and he gave us eternal comfort. Not temporary comfort, and also not worldly comfort. We are in this as image bearers of God, who have this relationship with Christ. And we look forward to the day when we are eternally in bliss and joy in heaven forever. But for now, we have this small piece of glory we operate with on mission in this world. And in the midst of this, you will have troubles and you will have trials. But in the midst of those, glory doesn't fade. Our mission doesn't change. Who we are in Christ doesn't alter. He has given us an eternal comfort. Well, Joel, that sounds great. And a good hope. That sounds really great. How do I do this? How does that look like? Well, it might look different for every person, but I do know one thing is that our dependence must be constant. We go back to Jesus again and again. And just the simple prayers of, Lord, I know that you've promised comfort in the now and in the eternity to come. And I know you've promised good hope. And right now I'm having a hard time. I'm wrestling through this. I don't know. I know that you've got Christ in me and I'm in Christ and I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to live life. I don't know what this looks like, God, but can you show me? I think the honesty of prayers is so important where we're at to say, this is what I know you have said and I trust you, God, but I don't necessarily know the how. I know that in the end it's going to be okay, but if, can, you, can you help me in the now? Those are, those are really good and really helpful prayers. Really helpful prayers. And it's through grace. Again, this is not something we've done. This is not something we can add. This is not something we can work for. This is not something we can attain. No matter how rich or famous or powerful we get, this is nothing that in our own human effort we can ever get a piece of it. This is only through the work of Jesus. This is only through the glory of God. This is only through what Christ brings to us as he lives inside of us and we in Christ. It is only through that. And that union, they call it union with Christ, doesn't end when we say yes to Jesus. We pray that and say, yep, okay, Jesus is here. But the union is forever. It is everlasting. It never goes away. It never changes. And it's only going to get better and stronger as we get to heaven. Comfort your hearts and then establish them in every good work and word. And that's really the most wonderful thing to end on. Every good work and word. It's not this well, I'm not a pastor, so I can't evangelize. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not really good at my words, so I can't share with faith. Well, I'm not really good at this, so I can't do it. Every good work means every good work. As we pump gas. I've had conversations about Jesus at a gas station before. I didn't even initiate them, but I was aware of what God wants to do. I, every good work means when you're doing something, you can reflect the glory of God. You can be thinking about sharing this because as it changes us, as we have joy in this, you, you can't help it but to let it come out, to, to let it affect every action that you do. That's every good work. It means every single good work. And every word. As we go about, as we are living, as we're wrestling through this idea of what does it mean that God has glory in me? It, it seems like something we just want to be like, no, 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 I don't want that. And that's okay, and that's an okay thing to start with. But it's not something that we can deny because it's not us. It's not ours to deny. God has made us in this way and has given us this glory so that we might reflect it for his glory. 
the greater glory, the eternal glory, the one from whom everything else comes. It's not mine. I, I can't, don't, don't throw it off if it's God. Don't get rid of it if it's Christ in you coming out. Don't try to, ref, to, to do those things. Be the reflector that God has made us to be in Christ. 